right. We'll have a word of prayer and get back in our third lesson in the book of Daniel. I hope you enjoy the study of the book of Daniel. We are just now immersing ourselves into this great, great, wonderful book of the Bible, the book of Daniel. All right. Let's pray. Take nothing for granted when you open the pages of the Word of God. You don't approach, approach it with human intellect so you can take credit for anything. The natural man receiveth not. Father, in Jesus' name, open my heart, Lord, that I might receive this book. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you give me a heart then, Lord, that will embrace it and reach up and grasp what my mind cannot conceive, Father. But with my heart, I can reach much, much further. And I pray you'd give the people the ears to hear and then a heart to receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. And amen. All right. Now, we have come to the vision of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And if you remember, this is about 606 B.C. to set it chronologically, which puts it at, according to what we say, the beginning of the times of the Gentiles, which teaches us immediately that God does things according to certain times or periods, or as the New Testament uses the term, dispensations. The Apostle Paul used the term dispensation more than once in reference to the way that uh, God dealt with man. So that ought to make us begin to think that if God's going to deal with man according to a certain standard during a certain dispensation, then we need to be alert to the fact that he may deal with men according to another standard in another dispensation. This is why we're dispensationalists. What takes place here along about 606 B.C. in the book of Daniel is the beginning of the times of the Gentiles, and it starts with Nebuchadnezzar, and the first image or the first vision has to do with an image as it relates to the times of the Gentiles. Now, more visions follow. More revelation follows in the book of Daniel. When we get the first image correct, then we can launch on in further into the others as to what happens when we see these beasts and uh, goats and uh, all these other things as they begin to show up in the book of Daniel. But I want to point something out to you that I think is that's overlooked a lot. And God has he, has, he has emphasized this in the book of Daniel. And I tried to make, I tried to show, I tried to emphasize this as we started the study. Remember how I told you that there's a confrontation that takes place in the book of Daniel between the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the gods of the Babylonians. Now, on the surface of it, in the face of it, you'd think, well, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not much of a God if he allowed his people to be carried off into captivity, lose their homeland, their identity, because they started changing their names. So what kind of a God is that? And so in the book of Daniel, the Lord God has, is going to show you how that he is not only able to control the affairs of nations, but he's also able to reach out to a king who happens to be Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler of the world. And here in the book of Daniel, the first uh, part of the, the image had a head of gold, had a chest of silver, midsection of brass, legs of iron, and then feet of iron, and then toes of iron mixed with clay. Ten toes, of course, on the feet. The Bible says plainly that the head is Nebuchadnezzar. And we read the book of Daniel, we see where the Medes and the Persians overthrew Belshazzar. So we find then the chest of silver is the Medes and Persians. Then we have a midsection of brass. And we realize that the Grecians are the ones who overthrew the Medes and Persians. And we know from history that Alexander the Great, whose father was Philip of Macedonia. He was a Macedonian, which is the northern part of Greece, which is really a different culture. But in any event, Philip of Macedonia's son, Alexander the Great, became leader of Greece and was a conqueror. He went forth in conquest to build an empire. And then finally we find Rome, which, has, uh, which is represented by iron, two legs of iron, which therefore gives us a split in the power of Rome, which took place about 1050 A.D. We know it's Rome because Rome was in power when Christ was here 2,000 years ago, and no 
world power preceded Rome apart from Greece. Therefore, according to the book of Daniel, we have four world powers. Never have we had a fifth. Four world powers. We've had a lot of wannabes, but only four. And that, of course, as I've said to you a moment ago, is Babylon, Medes and Persians, Grecians, the Romans. But when we come to the Romans, we come to a different situation altogether because it not only is a world power, but it splits. And then it goes into a mysterious state in its feet. And we'll cover that in a little while. Right now, I want to talk about Nebuchadnezzar. We have a man here who's a pagan king. He has, he has about as much knowledge of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the average American. Amen. Zip. Zip. Uh, and so Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, who happens to be the king, literally, of the world. And he is called a king of kings. The title's only given to one other person in the Bible. He's called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we find that in the book of Revelation. And we find that in reference to His second advent when He comes back. And when He comes back in the second advent, Revelation 19, it's not to establish the church. When He comes in Revelation chapter number 19, He comes as a man of war. And when He comes in Revelation 19, He comes to take the kingdoms of this world. So the kingdom's a big issue here. So the first king that had a world kingdom was Nebuchadnezzar, and he's the king of Babylon, which, was the, which is the seat or the heart or the beginning of civilization because it is located in Mesopotamia. And that literally means the land between the rivers. The rivers would be the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And according to the book of Genesis, that is the eastern boundary of the land of Eden. And God planted a garden eastward in Eden, which would, put, which would put it somewhere in that area. And He created the man from the dust of the ground. Where He made the man from, I don't have a clue. But I know it was that Adam was made in Eden somewhere. The Jewish rabbis teach, have taught for centuries that Adam was created in Jerusalem and that he was on Mount Moriah. Now, of course, you know, they have a reason, they have a vested interest for teaching that. Uh, you know, connects them with Jerusalem and all that. But I don't, uh, I don't find any reason to disagree with them. Because if you take a, 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 a uh, schematic or a, an outline of a human body and superimpose it on Mount Moriah, you'd be amazed to find out that the skull of a human body is at Golgotha. And the bottom part of the human body is it Gehenna? That's quite a remarkable thing was done a long time ago. That this valley, Gehenna, Hinnom, Valley of Hinnom, which the Lord looked at and said, if you want to see a picture of hell, that's it right there. When you look to the north, you have the skull, and that connects somewhere in the New Testament, doesn't it? What does the skull connect with in the New Testament? The place of the skull. That's where he was crucified. All right. Is he not the head? Yes, he's the head. And the head was crucified at Golgotha. That's where uh, uh, Charles, uh, what was his name, Warren, uh, British General Gordon. Was it Gordon? He marched into Jerusalem. He wouldn't ride in. He said, I'm not about to ride in on a horse when my Lord rode in on a donkey. So he got off and walked in. And you can find a video of that with him walking in. But anyway, yeah, Gordon, Gordon, Gordon's Calvary. That's what Charles Gordon, British general. And uh, he, he chose that place. He said, this looks to me like it would fit because it's outside the gate, so forth and so on. So in any event, the land of Israel is remarkable in the sense that it sits like that. So we have a Gentile king. His name is Nebuchadnezzar, and God gives him a vision. I want you to notice Nebuchadnezzar and God. Let's look at this this morning. Look at chapter number 2 and verse number 47. Gen uh, Daniel chapter number 2 and verse number 47. Having been told of his first vision, the king responds. Verse 46, He fell upon his face, worshipped Daniel, and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. Anything wrong with worshipping a man? 
Certainly. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods. All right, he has begun to elevate him. And a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. He's going to know much more of him than this. But at least he's begun to say he's greater than the other gods. He's a God of gods. But he's still a polytheist. You see, Nebuchadnezzar still believes there's a lot of gods out there besides the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You must remember he's the God of his enemy. Remember now that this is the God of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and Daniel. And so he said he's a God of gods. But look at chapter number 3 and verse 1, immediately what follows. The king made an image of gold. And the image that he made of gold if you'll notice, is associated with a number 666 in verse number 1. That's not a coincidence, because in Revelation chapter number 13, another image is raised up, which is associated with a number 666. But look at chapter number 3 in verse number 25. He took Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah and threw them into a burning, fiery furnace, because they would not bow down before the image. You see, he's still an idolater. All right? He's a polytheist and he's an idolater. Nebuchadnezzar is still all of these things. And when Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah would not bow down before this image, he threw them into a furnace that had been heated seven times hotter than it ever had before. But look what he sees in verse 25, chapter number 3 of Daniel. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. Loose, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. Now, if you have a new Bible, any of the new Bibles, I don't care which one you get, it'll say a son of the gods. The reason it does is because the Hebrew, plural Hebrew noun, Elohim, is used here. Now, why would he use that term? He'd use it because he didn't know anything about Jehovah. All right. But now, the plural Hebrew noun Elohim in the book of Genesis chapter number 1 in any of the new Bibles will say, in the beginning, God. It's translated in the singular. You don't have, Does the NIV say, in the beginning, God's created the heaven and the earth? No. Why? Because they'd immediately be laughed out of the house if they did that. So they took the Hebrew word Elohim and translated it in the singular. It's a plural Hebrew noun. It means three or more. Now, in Hebrew, you have singular, you have dual, and you have plural. The English language doesn't have that. The English language has singular and plural. Singular one, plural two or more. In Hebrew, you have one, two, or three or more. So why would the Hebrew noun... Elohim refer to three or more. The Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. All right. God the Father's will was performed through God the Son who did the direct act of creation by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. John chapter 1, all things were made by Him. Colossians 1 says all things were made for Him. All right. Let's, let's, let's get along here. We get hung up. So when He looked into the, in, into the fiery furnace... He saw one likened to the Son of God. King James translators did not translate gods. They translated Elohim God. Why did they do that? They were what? Well, I believe God led them, don't you? Why, why inspire the English language if you don't transmit it down to another language? What purpose is there? There's no reason to inspire it if you don't transmit it. What good is a Greek text inspired for you or a Hebrew text inspired for you? The idea is that when they translated this thing, they looked at that carefully. They, these men, you're talking about men who forgot more about Greek and Hebrew than we know. And yet when they came to this text, they could have translated it in the plural or in the singular. And they translated it in the singular. Now that immediately raises a question. In Nebuchadnezzar's relationship with God, what did he see when he looked into that fiery furnace? And who was that? 
That's what it says right here. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who he saw. And therefore God gave this pagan king, if we can believe our Bibles, and I'm a Bible believer, are you a Bible believer? Amen. Then we can believe our Bible. God gave this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, a vision of the Son of God. Now you see, only a King James Bible believer would believe that. Because all the rest of the Bibles lose that. It's gone. It's, it's you know, verboten. <laughs> gone. But here, we believe that. That God is giving this man more of a revelation of himself. Why? Because he hasn't rejected what he had received so far. Let's go further with him. Chapter number 3, verse number 29, the book of Daniel. Therefore I make a decree that every nation, people, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Their houses shall be made a dunghill. All right? And because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Now he's begun to set him apart. He's not only a God of gods, but there's no other God like Him. Yeah, well, there's not that the name of one of those Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. No other God like Him. Exactly. Look at chapter number 4 and verse number 25. Daniel 4, 25. Here's a prophecy now of how God's going to deal with Nebuchadnezzar. Why would God take so much time with this man? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Why would He take so much time with him? Well, what does He matter? But He does. Chapter number 4, verse 25. They shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, shall make thee eat grass as an oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven seven times. And Daniel defines a time as a year. Seven times shall pass over thee. You'll be out there seven years. Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now he's a sovereign God. He knows more of him. Chapter number 4, verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes to heaven, seven years later. And mine understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High. That's a term that the Father of the faithful used in reference to him. The Father of all who believe used. Who was that? Abraham. Blessed be the Most High God. He used that when he was standing before that high priest. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever. Now, my goodness, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, his kingdom from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand, or say to him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned to me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom. And excellent majesty added unto me, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to base. Did he say one thing you disagree with? From his first testimony, uh, he's a god of gods, to this testimony, Nebuchadnezzar's come quite a ways. And he spent seven years out there in the field. All right, now remember, Nebuchadnezzar is not a Jewish high priest. All right, like, and neither was Melchizedek either. He wasn't a Jewish high priest. He was a Gentile high priest. All right, so we have a man here who is the king of kings, who has finally come to a declaration of God. The fact of the matter is, I want to point this out to you. When it comes to an Old Testament believer, especially a Gentile, there is no greater truth that he could understand or know or confess than what you just heard from the mouth of, ne mouth of Nebuchadnezzar. Next question. When Nebuchadnezzar died, where did he go? Did he go to hell? Where do you think he went? There's a reason for all this. What's the point? You see? Turn to Jeremiah 9, 23. 
Jeremiah 9, 23. Thus saith Jehovah, that capital L-O-R-D, the King James translators used what's called printer's type, simply large capital letters. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. That's what the Chaldean did. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. That's the one who builded greater barns. But let him that glorieth glory in this. And I do. And I stake my future on this. Amen. And my eternity and my soul. Amen. And I don't care what any man says. That he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am the Lord Jehovah. Which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Amen. You hide behind your religion all you want to. Amen. I don't care what religion you belong to. Amen. And who your God is. There's a God in heaven that judges mankind in righteousness, Amen. judgment, Amen. holiness, purity. And he hasn't changed one whit Amen. and some of the big church men are going to be surprised to find themselves in judgment now that's not the full revelation of God that's his character that's his character the full revelation of God is when he manifested himself in Jesus Christ I'm not going to go back under an Old Testament understanding of God and rule out what Christ did and who he is he's God you see, because I know that. How do I know that? I know that because I have a Bible. Nebuchadnezzar didn't know anything about Jesus Christ, but he certainly knew there's somebody here that ain't a man. There's something going on inside this that's above me. There's somebody there that's much greater than I am, one likened to the Son of God. And he accepted what he saw, believed it, and when he did, my personal belief is that you'll find Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, in glory. The king of Babylon. The first person in the line of Gentile kings that make up the times of the Gentiles. Now the Lord said through Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar, there will rise another kingdom inferior to thee. Now I begin to ask myself the question, when he says that these kingdoms are inferior to one and another, in other words, they are the, the Medes and the Persians are inferior to the, to the Babylonians. The Grecians are inferior to the Medes and Persians. The Romans are inferior to the Grecians. And this ultimate end, where we have ten toes mixed with clay, is the ultimate bottom. <laughs> That's as bad as it gets. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So therefore, we start with gold in the Bible from one end to the other. What does gold represent? Deity. The Ark of the Covenant was made out of sheet of wood and covered with gold. The tabernacle, of, the temple of God that Solomon built, you walked inside walls of, uh, were, were, were built with the, with the cedars of Lebanon, but they were covered with gold. Gold represents deity. And uh, you can get into all of the issues about gold and all, all, why it's so valuable and so forth and so on, but it's an accepted fact, folks. If you had, uh, if, let's say you had 1,000 pounds of gold, 20 years ago, you are a multi, 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 multi billionaire, and you always will be. I don't care whose stock market goes belly up. For that's one commodity that the whole world always recognizes is gold. Because it has, it has an exchange value. It has a value among man. And it's not going to change. All right, anyway. He has a head of gold. All right. That's Nebuchadnezzar. But then it begins to de degenerate. So what's the point here? What's God trying to say to you? Since He has manifested Himself and revealed Himself to Nebuchadnezzar, and He has. The testimony that Nebuchadnezzar gave right here in the book of uh, Daniel is clear testimony and is as good as any Gentile could ever give. And yet when it comes down to Rome, the two legs of Rome, it's the most religious of all of the image. When you come to the Roman Empire, you had the 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 uh, the Caesar. That's what's called an appellative. An appellative simply means that it's not his name; it's his title. Okay, he's a Caesar. 
And the, and, and the Russians use the term czar, taking it straightly, straight, straight from that, all right? You have a Roman S Caesar, all right? Julius Caesar, the Caesar, the Caesar. He's the head not only of state, but he's the head of religion. Being the head of state, he's the head of the Roman government, the head of the Roman Senate, and the head of the Roman power. But he's also the head of a religion. Because not only did Rome have thousands and thousands of gods and assimilate anybody's god, it didn't make any difference who they were. Come on in, join the crowd, get in the pantheon here, no problem. But just remember that you will bow before the Caesar of Rome because he is the head of the religion and all other religions. And you know what the term was for the head of the, of the Caesar of Rome? In, in, his, in, his, uh, in his capacity of the head of his religion? Pontifus Maximus. That's what he was called. Do you know who has that title today? The Pope. And all you have to do is do a little work and trace the origins of the Roman Catholic Church back to ancient Rome and you'll find out that the whole College of Cardinals, Cardo is Latin for holder of the keys, the one who unlocks the door, allows others to come in or shuts the door where they can't come in. The College of Cardinals are the ones who pick the Pope. He is surrounded with virgins. The Pope, the, uh, the uh, Pontifus Maximus was, were called Vestal Virgins. And these Vestal Virgins have handed their, uh, their identity down to the, to the uh, nuns of today. All of the stuff that was there in the ancient Roman religion is part and parcel of what calls itself Christianity today. Isn't that a shame? Because you start with a head of gold of a pagan emperor who didn't know one, he didn't know a thing about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and wound up being saved to the bottom of this thing where it splits itself in 1050 A.D. to the eastern branch and, and, and western branch, the European branch which professes to be the very vicar of Christ and they know less about God than they did. That's the problem. That's the issue. That's what's going on in this image. And if you can't see that, you've missed the point. To me, that's the point of the image. It has nothing to do with power. It has nothing to do with how far their kingdoms went. It has nothing to do with what men consider to be the important things. It has to do with the simple fact that the Medes and the Persians, though they took the authority, power, kingdom, away from the Babylonians, were inferior to them. And the same with the Grecians, inferior to them. And on down the line until you come to the place at the bottom where you have. Now, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find this spiritual thread running through the whole book of Daniel. You're going to find out that's what he's talking about. He uses physical things. He uses symbols. He uses animals and so forth. But it, the, the, the point of the message is what happens to the revelation and manifestation and administration of the truth and where it winds up. And that's what Daniel's going to be talking about. There is the original revelation and then there is the corruption of the revelation and there is the presence of the truth at the end. Do you have the truth? Amen. Are you firmly convinced you've got the truth? Yes, how do you know that? Do you think a Baptist as being a Baptist is, is any better than a Catholic or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a No. That's as amazing as any God as it can be. The only thing, the only thing that he really sees is his son. son. And if you and are if you are the blood of the blood, you are his son. son. And he said, and he said, three together, together and he gives in his name, he'll come and come in his Therefore, he is the that becomes the habitation of God, 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 the Spirit. Spirit. That's the church. That's the church. Whether they call it called the Reverend, brethren, brethren, or whether or whether it's called the Plymouth brethren, brethren, or whether or whether it's called the Anglican, Anglican, or whether or whether it's called the Catholic, Catholic, or the Baptist, or what have you. The truth of the matter is, it's all, it's all about, about Jesus Christ. Christ. So therefore, 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 therefore,
start with the head of the bill. The members of the Congress have understanding of the revelation of the Rebels, 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 the R
understand what's going on here. And that's it. That's it. So what he did, so what he, did he turned he around, turned around and, and handed the kingdom, the kingdom to the Gentiles. Gentiles. See? See? And when he handed, when he handed, handed the kingdom to the Gentiles, the Gentiles he took the, the first, first Gentile town king and gave him a manifestation of himself, self, and the truth. The truth. And then what? And then what happened? How well, how well did they take the truth? The truth. What do you say? What do you say? Chapter number one. How was it? How, how was it? Was it time? Time? What do you got to do? What do you got to do? What do you build the rails around? That's about two thousand years ago. About the Romans. About the Romans. What the average, the average Roman was like? What the Roman was like? What the two thousand years ago? What the hell? The hell? That's all you can say. You can say for it. So, so what did the Gentiles do? Did they with that change? Knowledge, knowledge of God. They had. They had. Preferred, preferred story, the story. Throw it away, throw it away. All right, all right. Now, now. He gave the church to the church two thousand years ago. Truth, truth. All right, all right. He gave the church to the church to the truth, right? All right. Now, here we are, here we are, two thousand years later. All right, all right. How does, how does the church teach truth, truth? How does God teach truth, 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 church? How do you how know, know that you have the truth? How do you how know, know you know for certain that what you believe is right? Is that an important question? That demands an answer. answer. All right, all right. Well, I feel, well, I, feel I don't care, I don't care how you feel. <laughs> well, Jesus, well, Jesus, you know, you might not feel, feel, feel good. good. What well, you do yesterday? You do yesterday. Well, so and so and so. I don't care what they told you. How do you know? How do you know you've got the truth? How do you know you've got the truth? How do you know you know what you what have? You have? It's the truth. It's the truth. Power of the power of your spirit, all right, all right. Now we keep talking about, talking about the Holy Ghost. Ghost. Then one man, one man raised the Bible. Bible. All right, all right. You think God has a reason, reason, reason for giving us this? Yes, you got a reason, got a reason for it, didn't you? Said Moses, said Moses, 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 We've got a book, 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 all right, we've got a book, 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 all those, all those full of books. All right, all right. So why, 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 why did... Yes, sir, yes, sir. Do you know he's alive? How do you know he's alive? Do you know he's alive? Do you know he's alive? Well, I know you can make some sense out about that. All right, all right. Now, there's, now, there's an issue going, going on. on. Okay, okay. You got the book. The book. What else? What else goes with the book? And they're inserting the set. What? What? The spirit. Spirit. All right. All right. Now, now let's go here. Let's go here. Look at First John. I wasn't playing with the ideas, but I told you before. I told you before. I like being, being just, uh, you know, you know, get up here, get up here, and let the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost lead us. All right. All right. First John. First John five. First John. First John chapter five. five. Verse six. Verse six. Came by water and blood, and blood, even Jesus even Christ. Christ. Not by water and blood only, only, but by water and blood. blood. Now watch this. Watch this. It is the it spirit, is spirit, 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 spirit that beareth bearer witness, witness, because the spirit, spirit, spirit is true. Is truth. All right. All right. Now what spirit are we talking about here? About here? Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. There's a lot of God. He's the Holy One. All right. All right. For there are three, three, three that bear record, 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 record in heaven. We've got a record, 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 record being born. The Father, Father the Word, Word, and the Holy and the Ghost. Ghost. And these, and these three, three are, are one. one. And there and are three, three that bear witness, witness, witness in the earth. In the, earth. The, spirit, the Spirit, the Water, water and the Blood. And, the blood. and these, and these three, three agree, agree in one. In one. If we if receive the witness of men, the witness of God, God is greater. Great. This is the witness of the God. of God who testifies the Son of His Son. And here is the issue. issue. He that he believed, believed the Son of the Son. Now, now. How do you know how you the Holy Ghost is with us and through us? He's in Jesus Christ, Christ, the right hand, right hand, right hand, right hand, the dead. How do you know there's some, some, some deep, 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 There's something, there's something that happens, happens to a believer, believer that's far, far, far more, more than intellectual. It's the it's witness, witness, it's the it's witness, witness, yes, gives, gives true, true, and credibility to everything we believe. There's something, there's something, something that happens, that happens to somebody, somebody believes, believes that's, different. that's different. And the world, and the world cannot, cannot copy, copy it. See, see. They try, they try to. And religion, and religion. 
to it certainly is tough. Try to. Try to. So what is what is what is what is it that makes the difference? The new birth. The new birth. The new birth. The new birth. You remember what we were talking about? We were just in here. The new birth. The new birth. Therefore, it is the power of the Holy Ghost witnessing the same word of word by the new birth that you that you judge the truth. What do you believe? You believe that? Well, here's the only here's the only way you deserve for certain. At one, at one time, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not. And if you can not find, find clear, clear line, line, line separate, separate, you were this or this or this or this now, this now then you don't know what we're talking, talking, talking about. That's what the new birth is about. Religion, about. religion, religion goes out of here and the man to man wall to wall. Ten to man fine, fine, folks. Religion will hang the man to man wall to wall. That's what that is. That's what we want. There's a certificate of, 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 years after God gave the truth to the church, just like when he gave to Nebuchadnezzar a revelation of himself in 606 B.C., and you see where it is today, what you have left today is this, that if your church, group, organization, outfit, whatever you call yourself, does not have the power of the Holy Spirit witnessing the truth of the Bible through the new birth of the believer, you got nothing. 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 Care what you call yourself. You agree with that? Yeah. Buddy, I do. I do. I do. I do because there was 27 years I was over there. And then at 27 years, I came over here. And at 27 years, I didn't ask to come from over there to over here. Somebody bigger than me Amen. came down and touched me when I was 27 years old. And he changed me from what I used to be and who I am now. I'm not perfect. No, I'm not perfect. But I understand what the work of the, work of the Holy Spirit is and, and, uh, and uh, sanctification and, and He's beginning a work and doing it throughout your life. Okay. Now that's a practical thing, isn't it? But does it put it in perspective? What's it about? Now, you see, when it comes down to the actual presence of a kingdom, we're going to deal with that because a stone is cut out of a mountain and it smites this image. And when it smites this image, where does it smite it? Where? Why doesn't it hit it in the midsection? Well, yeah, but there's a chronology involved here, okay? There's a span of time, 606 B.C. to the present time, all right? There's a chronology involved, but there's another reason. Why doesn't it hit it? Say, why doesn't it hit it in the midsection? I mean, you know, you can knock a man's feet out from under him, but you're not going to kill him. Are you? You know, I, I hate to be mean, but uh, when, if you want to stop a man, the, uh, you'd take any target right here, center mass. That's what they call it. You, police call it that. Military calls it that. Center mass. That's what you're going for. Heart, lung, uh, that's where you want to place that. Round shot placement, that's it. That's all. That's what matters, shot placement. Care how big a gun you're using? Shot placement. Shot placement. Okay? So why isn't it hit at center mass? Why is it hit on its feet? Why a blow on the feet literally destroys this image? We'll cover that next week, okay? <laughs> There's reason. There's big reason. There's big reason. Why a blow to the feet? You know? You can knock a man's legs out from under him, but he still shoots you. You've got an M14 in your hand. Man, knock me down. If I got that M14 in my hands, he's still gone. He's history. But if you... Uh, image is smitten on the feet by a stone. Why a stone? Pardon? Why is he called a stone, though? I know it's built on that, but why, did, why didn't God call him a, a foundation? I mean, why doesn't he call him something else like a, a like a, like a, you know, uh, use some other kind of a term instead of a stone? Uh, pardon? 
Well, now think about it. Where do stones come from? They come out of the earth, don't they? They come out of the earth. They, they, they're, they're dug up from the earth. They're brought up from the ground, all right? Like a root out of a dry ground, okay? Where he came from, he came from weakness, as weak as you could get. And the Bible says that he's died in weakness. He sacrificed himself in weakness, not in strength, folks, in weakness. We'll, take, we'll deal with it next week. All right, Brother uh, Van Caldwell, will you lead us in prayer, please?